we have kept this tradition of, uh, of doing the annual questionnaire, and now this is will be will be in the last one or two years. I can say also on my part, it kind of fell a bit out, but it will come back, as I understood, with a focus on how teachers can be stimulated to actually be researchers, contribute to research. That that there is a cooperation there, and the team met the, earlier this week, and I haven't seen exactly the results, but I heard that we have work to do in this field. The report has been sent out. Wonderful. But it has to be distributed. Yeah. Uh, fundraising, uh, we continue to try to, as well, identify opportunities, uh, apply for opportunities identified. But for you, I would just like to highlight uh, uh, this one, that Euroclio is in a bit of an interesting situation. In the Netherlands, we are the head of the Dutch network of the Annalint Foundation. Very briefly, the Annalint Foundation is headquartered in Alexandria and is mandated by 42 one, by now, 43 countries across Europe and the Mediterranean to work on dialogue between the north and the south of the Mediterranean. We know how important this issue is um, nowadays, and the key point I wanted to raise here is that your associations uh, I think almost all can and are eligible to join the Annalyn Foundation as a member, which is totally free, it's just one registration form. And that will help us involve you in future grant writing and also, like Rita has done with Finnish, try to identify if you have these partnerships. So I know some of you have study visits to Istanbul or Morocco. So let's see if we can synthesize that. So that is something for your association to join the Annalyn Foundation share with us what partners you have in the South, have them join their and local analytics foundation, and that will make us eligible for some interesting projects. And finally, we can we, yeah, of course, okay. uh, That's the yeah, very important point. It fell out of the slide, but Sonata said there is a project that they have that is not run by Europeo, but we did help to write the application. Yes. And this is something that we are very happy to do. First of all, we have a lot of texts and we know how to write applications. So what we, what we need from you are the ideas and the needs. And then we can help you write also the World War One project in Macedonia, or do you wish to say yeah? Yeah, just, this is like a first step in one bigger project that we yeah. are going to have. So it would be great. Yeah. So we see that as a service, really. But it's, it's much better when you come to us. We need to work on this area here. And then we can start a communication there. So finally, finally. You have seen Ben, the moment here. You have seen Jaco already in the week. We have trainees that are the best for us is if they represent the diversity of Europe. So we are not seeking to run an office which is totally and 100% Dutch. So at the moment, we have trainees from Spain, France, Croatia, uh, Northern Ireland, and the Netherlands. And we hope for the future to continue that. So the call will be spread in the coming newsletter. But please do send it around to people you know in universities that are working with Erasmus grants or whatever. We're looking forward to the applications uh, for, for Tunisia at Europeo, which are, I really see that, a quite unique tool for professional development of, of young people in a very flat and open and friendly and sometimes too sarcastic word area. That was uh, the action for the future. If you have any questions, you know where I am. Go we, we continue there? Okay. Then, actually, if I just allow me to do a very brief introduction to that, one of the main interesting things for us in 2015 is what Stephen went up to. So, yeah, this is actually quite a fundamental discussion that we're going to have um, about models of uh, membership fees uh, quite at the heart of the democracy of Europe, Leo. So it's, I think, suiting to the theme of the conference. Um, and we've prepared that with uh, first the membership board committee, um, but then also discussed it, of course, in the full board. 
and then we decided that this is actually such an important topic that um, we allocate quite a lot of space for the discussions with you. So this is not only going to be listening uh, after uh, the presentations, there will be lots of discussions by yourself. Um, but first a bit of a history of the membership fee system, because uh, there was the latest change in 2011 uh, during the annual conference in, in Poland, in Grishova. The fees have been, before that, the fees were determined by size of the association only. So how many members do you have? If you have many members, like more than a thousand, then you have to pay a lot of money compared to the associations that don't have a lot of members who, in comparison, didn't have to pay a lot of money. So, but then there was a discussion about whether that is fair and whether it should be taken into account what the salaries of teachers are, for example. So this resulted in a new system and a new proposal um, that was accepted during the General Assembly in 2011. And after that, the fees were no longer determined only by the size of the association. <coughs> also, we decided to two categories of countries, um, and we used uh, the categorization of the EU within the lifelong learning program. Um, so that actually, that is still in force. But now, in 2014, uh, there was a new program and a new categorization. So the system on which we based our division no longer exists. So, uh, and that led to questions from member association, actually it was the Finnish uh, History Teachers Association that came up with that question. And then there was lots of discussion about this uh, within the board. And, um, well, that leads why uh, we are now going to consult you. So basically, the distribution of the membership fee uh, is based on categorization that is outdated. But also, we noticed, and it was also discussed with uh, the audit committee, that members' real capacity to pay an average teacher's income are still not fully taken into account. There were some categorization, but, uh, and in the new system, we looked at some alternatives, and then you could see that some countries were put together in a category where people felt that they shouldn't be in the same category. That was actually the first concern. Um, then we also have the very fundamental thing that voting is currently the only exclusive full membership right and it's directly linked to the payment of the membership fee. So if you don't pay, you can't vote. And is that the most democratic system? Uh, but it's also that at the moment it's basically an incentive to pay, which also allows us to do like many things because even though the membership fee only accounts for 0.5% of uh, the income of your PO, you can actually see that the difference between expenditures and income is also very little. So if you compare it with the positive, with the result of the year, it is actually quite significant. So it's just how you look at it, at these numbers. Um, so these are actually, all these issues were on the table and the board felt, okay, it's not good to just propose a new system, actually, and rush things. We just want to know what the members think. So the key question, as we see it, from the member, uh, should committee and the of the board, is what membership model supports the implementation of the European mission most? So we felt, okay, that is, that's the main question in terms of governance, in terms of uh, membership fees. So, look, well, you are familiar with the mission. It's all written down in the statutes if you want to get the exact phrasing uh, on the European website. <coughs> and then there are some considerations, so just things to think about. One is that we very much value democracy. Uh, the democratic nature of European also gives it legitimacy. We are now going to the European, um, to the European Council and we say, well, thank you very much for your declaration. We looked at it in a democratic nature and we are now going to uh, give input. So it also suits the mission to be democratic and then you also have, but then it leads sort of who has the vote. 
So at the moment, only associations have to vote, who are democratic associations themselves, not the associated members, only the ones who pay. Um, if you're from a country where there's no association, you have no vote, for example. Then, what about the rights and responsibilities? What is the commitment from Europe Leo towards its members? What does it matter if you are a member, if you come for help? Um, should we prioritize? But also, what obligations do you have as a European member for the association? Um, because it's also not, I mean, we, we actually do many things. And you can say very often we are also seek for advice. For, okay, what do you want us to do? But it's also good to turn the tables and ask, okay, what can you do for us, uh, for, for the collective? And it's also, we see that there is lots of work. We have ambassadors who are representing the European. We see voluntary work in the project. For example, the conference has been organized with the, an excellent team of volunteers from the Danish History Teachers Association. That has been a lot of work, and that should also be recognized. So, um, so the recognition of the in-kind contribution, the value of sharing information, volunteer time, etc. So should it be only money, or is it also that we take other things into account? Then which membership services should be exclusive? Of course, if you say we are only going to do things if you're a member, then it becomes very attractive to a member. But the other side is that if we say it's for members only, then it means that sometimes we might miss some opportunities to implement our mission just because we say, no, you have to become a member first. I mean, how to do the work in Kyrgyzstan if you just get the first invitation as a well, no, you're not a member. Well, of course, if we go there and we have a long-standing working relationship, probably they're quite keen to become a member. But should it be the first step and a requirement to start cooperating? Um, so in a way, making membership exclusive is, means less freedom to implement the mission. Then there is also the benefits of paying membership fees. So what do you get in return for your membership fee? Um, or is it just like solidarity? We say, okay, we enable the organization to do the work that it does because we think that it's important. And we don't, we're not so much recognized sort of, okay, I pay this and then what's in it for me? Okay, so sometimes it's not such a direct transaction. Um, and of course, this is also what we are doing now. We are explaining all the work we've done over the last year, explaining about our projects, enabling you to have a say in the direction of Europe. Here. 